Hello, friends, and welcome to another WSIV Truth Matters with Joe Machado. I hope you're doing well today. So uh, today I'm going to conclude this three-part series uh, on the WSIV's reemployment obligations. Uh, I'm going to talk about special cases. There's five. Complying with reemployment obligations, reemployment penalties for employers, and most importantly, payments to workers. I want to thank those of you who have taken the time to watch the last two videos and you're with me again. You know, a long time ago, I learned way before I got into this business, uh, actually, when I had my injury and uh, I was trying to figure out uh, how things worked. Can you imagine? I was an 18 year old punk. Didn't know shit about anything. I'd only been in the country, I think, six months. Uh, I had just come over from uh, Portugal, the Azores, and then I had this injury. And uh, so I had to figure out pretty quickly how to, uh, what I was entitled to and trying to navigate this whole system. And uh, trust me, I get it. It's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> uh, and it can be overwhelming and it can cause you to quit. To give up and my advice is never give up never ever give up uh, so I learned what I learned many years ago is I needed to know what my rights were and I took it a step further and uh, learned the laws and decided to help injured workers with their cases because I knew there was thousands out there uh, I had been down. I had been down at the Downs View Rehabilitation Center um, on the 400, and uh, where the WSIB had their so-called hospital, and I spent three weeks there, and uh, it was it was a shit show, really. Uh, but anyway, it's evolved into a more, even more significant monster. I call it the demon. Uh, and many have tried to tame this demon, but it's been difficult. But anyway, it can be done. Uh, I guess my message is uh, I learned that knowledge is power. And it's true. Uh, and in, in this situation as in any other, uh, but particularly with the WSIB, if you know the laws and your rights, and what's actually written, not what some schmuck sitting behind a desk with zero um, life experience or experience as an injured or ill worker, uh, and what they come up with and write on the letter that over the years oftentimes isn't the actual law. When you have information and you have knowledge and you know what the law is and how to look for it and how to apply it to protect your rights, um, it's power. And that doesn't mean that you don't have to engage in appeals and, you know, argue a case, but knowing is power. And that's what I'm trying to do, not only with this series, but with my videos uh, and all of this content that I put out. Uh, I do it to help injured workers, and it's free uh, because I want you to succeed. So anyway, thank you for sticking around. And uh, we're going to get into this, uh, the last part of this series. And if you're any more confused now than when you started, there's an easy way out of it. Just send me an email at jomashadow at wsibsettlements.com with your specific information and situation. And uh, I will give you the information that, uh, that you seek, I promise. So this very next section talks about special cases and there's five and you may or may not fit into one of them. So uh, special case number one, fixed term contract workers. And this is what the policy states. The injury employer of a fixed term contract worker is only required to re-employ the worker in the pre-injury job 
an, an alternate job that is comparable or suitable work for the remainder of the fixed term employment contract that was interrupted by the work-related injury or disease. Self-explanatory, you have a contract for six months. Those are the parameters of that contract. However, it goes on to state, in cases where an injury employer has routinely extended or renewed a, a worker's fixed term employment contract in the past with no actual break in employment, the WSIB may conclude that the reemployment obligations extend beyond the end of the fixed term employment contract for the normal duration of the reemployment obligation. Very important. Number two, emergency workers. If an emergency worker is the employee of a regular employer covered under the WISIA, which is the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act, and receive benefits under the uh, uh, emergency workers policy 120403, the regular employer is responsible for complying with the reemployment obligation. The deemed emergency employer, however, reimburses the regular employer for the costs of meeting the uh, reemployment obligation. The above guidance applies to a member of a municipal volunteer brigade, a volunteer ambulance brigade, or an auxiliary, uh, auxiliary member of a police force under policy 120402, volunteer forces, as these workers are considered as though they are emergency workers for reemployment purposes. Pretty straightforward. Again, if you have any questions, send me an email. Uh, the other, the third one is dealing with seasonal employment. Uh, you get to see a lot of this in the construction industry uh, or farming. Uh, the policy states, the WSIB reviews the uh, past hiring practices of the injury employer to determine whether the employer intended to continuously employ the seasonal worker for the purposes of establishing of the condition of one year of continuous employment before the date of injury has been met. If the workplace parties or the WSIB questions whether the number of workers employed on the date of the worker's injury fairly represents the number of workers regularly employed, the WSIB determines the average number of workers employed in each of the 12 or fewer months that make up the full regular season of the injury employer's operation before the date of injury. If there are 20 or more workers in the majority of the months of the full regular season, the 20 or more workers reemployment condition is considered to have been met. When calculating the length of the reemployment obligation period, the off-season period is not excluded. However, during the off-season period, the injury employer's reemployment obligation is not in effect, nor is the employer subject to reemployment penalty, which I will get to in a few moments here. Again, uh, pretty straightforward. If you're in that situation, that would apply to you. Uh, the fourth one is temporary employment agency. So if you're hired uh, through an employment agency for a particular time with an employer, this would apply or this reemployment obligation section would apply to you. And the policy states, the reemployment obligation applies to temporary employment agencies if the worker was continuously on the temporary employment agency's placement roster for at least 12 months prior to the date of injury. It is not necessary that the worker be continuously or work assignments during this period. A temporary employment agency meets the reemployment obligation to offer the pre-injury job or an alternate job that is comparable by returning the worker to the employment placement roster for normal rotation to the job assignments. A temporary employment agency meets the reemployment obligation to offer suitable work by returning the worker to the employment placement roster and attempting to place the worker in the first opportunity for suitable work that becomes available. Again, pretty straightforward. If you're uh, uh, hired as a contract worker, uh, that pretty much explains what the reemployment ob obligations are. Um, having been part of the roster for a one year, not necessarily working in that time or maybe working intermittently but as long as you're part of that roster for one year then you meet that uh, requirement and then the fifth uh, special case deals with successor employers and the policy in this regard states following the sale or transfer of a business that employs workers covered under the workplace safety and insurance act 
The question of whether a reemployment obligation attaches to a successor employer, so that would be the new employer or the employer that purchased the business, depends on whether the successor employer is the same legal entity as the original employer. If the successor employer is the same legal entity as the original employer, reemployment obligations generally attach to the successor employer. On the other hand, if the successor employer is a different legal entity than the original employer, reemployment obligations generally do not attach to the successor employer. Typically, if a company or business is being bought out by a new entity, um, they don't necessarily create another business to buy out that business. Um, they generally just purchase the business, bring it under their umbrella. Uh, but in some cases, they do. So this um, section was intended to address situations of that nature. So this next section that, uh, that the policy covers is complying with reemployment obligations. And in this regard, the policy states that the worker's request or, or on its own initiative, initiative, the WSIB can review whether an injury employer has fully complied with their reemployment obligations. To conduct this review, the WSIB determines if the injury employer, A, has been notified of their employment obligations, B, made appropriate offers of a pre, uh, pre-injury job, an alternate job that is comparable or suitable work that is av available, uh, C, made appropriate job offers at times required. D, accommodated the worker and workplace as necessary to the extent of undue hardship, uh, hardship and um, maintained employment for the duration of the reemployment obligations. Failure to comply with reemployment obligations may result in penalties for the injury employer and wage loss payments to the worker. The WSIB reviews the specific facts of each situation, but generally does not levy reemployment penalties in circumstances such as terminations for reasons not connected to the injury, disease, or work cessations that are not intended by the worker or the injury employer to break the employment relationship, for example, strikes, sick, or parental uh, leaves, temporary or seasonal uh, layoffs. In situations such as these, what I find uh, the best course of action is if you have been terminated uh, or if the employer or you believe that the employer has violated its reemployment obligations, uh, the WSIB says in the policy that on their own initiative they can investigate, but don't wait for them. Notify the WSIB in writing. Make sure there's a record, uh, sorry, a record of you notifying them and make sure that you know exactly what your concerns are, why you've been let go or why you haven't been recalled, uh, why you've been terminated. Make sure that it's all appropriately stated in your communication to the WSIB, whether it be an email or a letter and request their assistance in making a determination as to whether or not your rights were uh, violated and the employer's reemployment obligations have been, um, well, whether the employers violated their reemployment obligations. Um, this next section talks about terminations uh, and what happens and how the WSIB deals with terminations of workers that are protected under reemployment obligations policy. In this regard, the policy states, if the worker is terminated while the reemployment obligation is still in effect, the WSIB can examine the circumstances to determine whether the termination was related to the work-related injury or disease and represents a breach of the injury employer's reemployment obligation. I can tell you the WSIB has special powers when it comes to this, to getting the information they require. The WSIB presumes the injury employer has not fulfilled their reemployment obligations when a worker is terminated within six months of being reemployed and the reemployment obligation is still in effect. 
workers who have th- uh, workers have three months to ask the WSIB to investigate it, investigate non-compliance. If the request is made after three months, the WSIB is not required to investigate, but may choose to do so. The WSIB may, may investigate on its own initiative at any time. Injury employers can rebut the presumption by showing that determination was not caused in any part by the work-related injury or disease and related absences from work, treatment for the work-related injury or disease, or the claim for benefits. When a rebuttal is successful, the WSIB will not levy a reemployment penalty. However, if the worker continues to experience a loss of earnings due to the injury or disease, they may be entitled to LOE benefits, return to work services, and they talk about that in policy 180302, uh, payment and reviewing LOE benefits prior to the final review. But the bottom line is this, any decision that the WSIB makes uh, following an investigation or even without investigating the reasons why you were terminated, and if you feel that, that that decision is an infringement on your rights, then you can appeal that decision and I encourage you to appeal it. 100% because the WSIB has been known to make sloppy and bullshit decisions. And if they're not appealed, they stand. And that's what they count on most often. And I'm telling you this from experience. I'm not pulling it out of the sky. I'm not making a statement based on what I hear. I'm making a statement based on 30 years of hands on experience dealing with employers and WSIB. And I can tell you, Everybody at one points out for their own freaking interests. And if you don't appeal, then you're shit out of luck. But the rules are here to protect you and to make sure that your rights are protected. And I always say, appeal, appeal, appeal. Everybody likes to play games. But you know what? When everybody is looking at the same piece of information and there's a higher authority that's saying, yeah, I don't think that was right. And that higher authority is the Workplace Safety and Insurance Appeals Tribunal. Guess what happens to the WSIB or employers who are trying to manipulate the system to screw you over. And I've seen it happen. All right, friends. This next section talks about reemployment penalties for employers. And this is what the policy states. When the WSIB is considering levying a a reemployment penalty, WSIB informs the injury employer about their obligation to reemploy the worker and identifies the specific requirement they are failing to meet, along with the possible penalty for noncompliance. This is done verbally where possible and in writing. Well, it should always be done in writing because verbally, you know what? People tend to forget shit. And it goes on. If the injury employer remains noncompliant, the WSIB notifies the employer that a penalty is to be levied for a breach of their reemployment obligations. The penalty is applied as of 10 calendar days after the date of the written notice. If the injury employer breaches their reemployment obligations at different times in the same claim, the WSIB may levy more than one penalty. And friends, I've seen this happen. And when it happens, it's nice because you get to see the real instances when the WSIB actually does something besides just talking about policies. They actually do shit. And employers, I've never seen one fine more than once because of the same claim. So... It's a pretty hefty fine, and let's just say that, uh, well, certain employers like Amazon, for example, nothing specific to them, but I'm hearing a lot of shit about uh, claims and how they're not being reported. Anyway, I have no issues with Amazon. What I am saying is larger employers can sometimes uh, try certain techniques, but... I've never seen it happen more than once. So that's the good news. So what's the amount of the penalty? Well, this is what the policy states. 
Generally, the WSIB levies a reemployment penalty based on the amount of the worker's actual net average earnings for the year before the injury. So if you earned $100,000 in the year before your injury, well, that's a hundred grand of that for that penalty. And then they go on to state this amount is not subject to the ceiling used in the calculation of LOE benefits. So there's a statutory maximum for each year as to how much loss of earnings benefits a worker can earn. And so if you, if you earn a hundred thousand dollars a year and, uh, the maximum covered is 75,000, for instance, you're going to lose 25,000. But the, the fine that the, uh, that the WSIB can levy can be the full 100,000. The maximum does not apply, which is quite clever, I think. Uh, the policy go, goes on to state the reemployment penalty is an amount owing to the WSIB in addition to the actual costs of ongoing benefits and services in the claim that are included in the injury employer's claim experience. It is not, folks, it is not in an employer's best interest to piss around with this whole situation because it can be costly and could potentially put them out of business. And then lastly, when applying the reemployment penalty, the penalty is apportioned based on the length of the remaining obligation period at the time the breach occurs. So basically, um, as you can see, uh, the penalties can be pretty stiff. And, um, you know, most employers that I dealt with over the last 30 years are very cooperative and um, will work with the employee and the WSIB to try and provide a job for the worker. But sometimes it's impossible and that's just the way it is. And uh, sometimes it's because of financial situations and that's why there's the, uh, the one section of the policy that uh, um, allows the employer to argue that it could be cost prohibitive uh, to re-employ the worker and potentially uh, be very harmful from a financial standpoint to the viability of the business. I get that. But, um, but these penalties are necessary to, as a deterrent to employers that are less than zealous over ensuring that these matters are dealt with the proper, uh, appropriately. And, um, uh, and the WSIB also has the ability to reduce the penalty, and the policy uh, states in this regard, the WSIB may reduce the penalty for injury employers who have breached their reemployment obligations, but sub sub subsequently come into full or partial compliance. And in that regard, they state, if the injury employer subsequently comes into full compliance and continues to comply fully for the remainder of the obligation period, the penalty will be based on the number of weeks the employer did not meet their reemployment obligations. Uh, and two, if the injury employer subsequently comes into partial compliance, the penalty may be reduced by 50% if the employer offers suitable work at no wage loss or by 25% of the employers, uh, the employer offers suitable work at a wage loss. The penalty is only reduced if the employment is maintained for the remainder of the obligation period. For information about reemployment penalties applicable to the construction industry, um, 190504 applies to that. And uh, if that's uh, if you are involved in the con uh, construction industry, I uh, encourage you to review the policy. If you have any concerns or questions, then you can email me, and uh, I'll provide you with the uh, with the uh, response to that. All right, friends, and this is the final section on the reemployment um, obligations um, policy, and it deals with uh, payments to workers. And in this regard, the policy states the following. When the injury employer fails to fully comply with their reemployment obligations, the WSIB may issue reemployment payments or pay LOE benefits to the worker, depending on the worker's level of fitness for work. And so they look at two the level of fitness to the pre-injury job or accommodated pre-injury job or suitable work. So in, um, in the first instance, 
If a worker is medically able to perform the essential duties of the pre-injury job with accommodation or is only able to perform suitable work and the injury employer fa fails to comply with their reemployment obligations, the WSIB pays LOE benefits to the worker from the date the reemployment obligation was breached. Full LOE benefits are paid as long as the worker has not returned to work and cooperates in health care measures and appropriate return to work services, even if these services extend beyond the date the reemployment obligations come to an end. And then dealing with the section of reemployment payments uh, fit for pre injury uh, work without accommodation, if a worker is medically able to perform the essential duties of the pre injury job without accommodation, they may no longer be entitled to LOE benefits. However, if the injury employer fails to comply with the reemployment obligations, the WSIB may issue reemployment payments to the worker. Reemployment payments are equal to LOE benefits, 85% of a worker's pre injury net average earnings, and are paid from the date the reemployment obligation was breached. Reemployment payments are issued for a period of up to one year from the date of the breach or until the end of the reemployment obligations, whichever comes first. If the worker has not returned to work and cooperates, if appropriate return to work services are in effect. So in these situations where the WSIB uh, finds that you are fit to perform the essential duties of your regular job without accommodations, basically they're saying that you're recovered and ready to go to work and the employer continues to uh, not provide you with your pre-injury uh, job, the WSIB can account for some of the LOE benefits, but I do recommend that you speak with a labor uh, lawyer uh, to deal or consider uh, a potential um, discrimination uh, case. And I also recommend that if you do continue to find yourself uh, unable to do your regular job and there's medical evidence to support that, and the WSIB is not accepting that medical evidence, appeal the decision. Uh, because just because the WSIB says that you're fit for your pre-injury pre job doesn't necessarily make it so if your uh, medical information supports otherwise. Okay, friends? So never give up. Um, yeah, so that pretty much concludes this three-part series. I hope that you found this information informative. Um, like I said before, I try to keep it um, clear, um, non-complicated, easy to follow. These are all policies of the WSIB. I didn't write any of this stuff. This is their stuff. And... Um, and if you have any questions about any of it, uh, by all means, send me, send me an email and I'll clarify whatever situation you may have. Um, the next video, I'm going to talk about an issue that I knew was going to, to happen. For those of you who watch my videos and you watched the last uh, one that I did about sometime last week or a couple of weeks ago, um, and I, I showed the, some of the WSIB's medical people, some of their medical staff, and how much they were earning. These are the people that overrule or regularly overrule a request for treatment or that your condition is such that you're able to go back to your pre-injury duties, duties uh, at when your doctor is saying that you were not. Uh, these people that continuously overrule your own doctor's opinions and the WSIB seems to always rely on those opinions. Um, well, I knew there was going to be a bit of an uproar, and that's good. I've gotten a lot of emails about that. And, uh, and that's a good thing, because this has been going on for way too long. And a lot of it was, well, how do I address it? Um, I mean, like the WSIB, they make their decisions, and my doctor said I could do it, but they're saying I can't. They cut me off, or they're going to cut me off. And and they deny treatment, and I understand that it's sometimes it's very difficult to find your way through this massive bureaucracy, and it can be intimidating. Um, 
but there are tools. There's tools that I've put together that work. And, um, and so my next video is titled <laughs> Fight Fire with Fire. And what I mean by that is you have to use their own language, their own verbiage, their own rules against them. But you also need to play tough and go a, another step, which is what they don't expect from you. And that's what I'm going to talk about in my next video, which is basically forcing the WSIB so-called uh, medical consultants uh, out of the shadows and into the spotlight where they deserve to be, not behind this big curtain providing bullshit opinions that I'm sure some of them probably don't even believe in it themselves, but they're being told that that's what they want to, that's what they want. And, uh, and bringing them into the spotlight because when that line is, that light is shining on them and on the WSIB for continuing to practice this bullshit, uh, no nonsense games to screw injured workers. There's only one way to fight them. Fight fire with fire. I have the tools. In the next video, I'm going to talk about them. And you want to be there for that one. And you want to share this video with everybody you know. Because this is the kind of information that impacts every single injured worker, regardless of what their claim date is. Whether it was the late 80s or the 90s or 2000s, and they're still trying to get benefits and they've been denied. And like we all know, happens. There's a way to fight these assholes. And we're going to do that. All right, friends. So thank you for my subscribers for sharing my videos. I really appreciate that. You're helping me to build this channel. I want to reach every single injured worker out there and let them know that there's help and never quit. If you're watching for the first time, I invite you to become a subscriber. It's free. Click the notification button as well when you subscribe and you get notified every time that I come out with a new video. And all of this information is free. All right, friends, as always, take care.